Order, order. I have one announcement to make. This evening at 8.15 p.m., the presidential debate will be on the motion that the British political system is unresponsive to the wishes of the people. All the candidates for the presidency in tomorrow's elections will speak, and the society will be visited by Mr. Dick Taverne, QC, Balliol, ex-librarian. There is no further private business. This afternoon, the society is to be addressed by the Honorable Richard M. Nixon, formerly President of the United States of America. President Nixon will talk on the subject of international affairs, and afterwards he will be taking questions strictly from members only. At the end of the session, President Nixon is going to speak for five minutes or so just to summarize the discussion. Uh, I don't think there's anything very much more to say, so I'd like you all to welcome Mr. Nixon to address the society on this subject. Thank you very much. Sir, all of us. I express my appreciation to all of you here in this room for your warm welcome, and those outside have made me feel very much at home. <laughs> I was saying to your president just before coming into this room that it was 20 years ago that I spoke at Oxford, exactly at this time. I saw someone nodding, but you couldn't have been born then. <laughs> I believe it was in this room. It, at least it was a room about this size. And as I thought back over those 20 years, and the subject which I am supposed to address today, it occurred to me that it might be well to look quickly over those years as to how the world has changed in that 20-year period. It has changed in many ways in your country and in mine. It has changed in many ways in the world, all parts of the world, but particularly in that area that affects the possibility of whether you may grow up in this last generation of the 20th century in a world in which there can be both peace and freedom. I think it is well for us to examine what has happened to the world in that respect. 20 years ago, the United States and what was called the free world had an enormous advantage over what was called the communist world militarily, particularly in the nuclear area. The United States had a strategic nuclear superiority that was unquestioned of about 10 to 1. And in the European theater, there was not as great a superiority, but it was significant, at least sufficient. In the 20 years since then, that gap has totally disappeared. The Soviet Union is today substantially ahead of the United States in terms of nuclear missiles or vehicles for delivery, and enormously ahead in terms of throw weight of nuclear weapons. The United States still has superiority in the fields of numbers of warheads and also in accuracy. However, the Soviet Union is rapidly closing those gaps because at this time, despite what you may read this morning in the paper with regard to the Soviet Union limiting its military expenses, in terms of military hardware, the Soviet Union today is spending annually 75% more per year than is the United States. Geographically, in that 20-year period, 
we find that in every area of the world, the communist powers have extended their domination. In no area of the world do we see a nation which was then communist and which is now non-communist. Briefly, Cuba in 1959, and then even in the period four years ago when I left office, in that period, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, South Yemen, several countries in Africa. Now when we look at that record, there is a tendency in those circles that are sophisticated in foreign policy to throw up their hands and say that uh, not only have we been losing, but that we are going to lose, certainly unless the trend is changed. I recall many years ago, in 1953, shortly after I became Vice President, General Eisenhower, as President, was telling me something from his own experience. We had some problems then in the world, and there was a tendency to be too much concerned, he thought, about the strength of those who might be our potential adversaries. And he said, I learned as a general, commanding the great forces in Europe, that it is important to know the strengths of your adversary and your own strengths and weaknesses. But too often, commanders do not analyze the weaknesses of their potential adversaries. Let's look briefly at that side of the picture. It is not often commented upon in the reports even that you may read. Economically, the advantage of those who live in what I call the West, and let us, for purposes of definition today in our discussion, refer to the West as the industrial West. And I include in that Western Europe, including, of course, Great Britain, the United States and Canada, and also Japan. The West, including those countries, has an advantage over the entire communist bloc, the Soviet Union and the countries of Eastern Europe, of almost five to one. Western Europe, without the United States and without Japan, has an advantage over all of the Soviet bloc countries of over two to one. The Soviet Union is having very difficult problems with its economy, partly due to the fact that they are putting such a great amount into armaments, and partly because of the inefficiency of their agriculture, and partly because of the inefficiency of much of their technological development in manufacturing and other areas. This, of course, of course has caused problems, problems that are not too well known, uh, dissent within their own country, of people who want more consumer goods. Then in the geopolitical sense, all of us are aware of the fact that the Soviet Union and the other great communist giant, the People's Republic of China, are at odds and have, in my view, probably irreconcilable differences in our time. In other areas, we find that Vietnam and Cambodia are virtually on the brink of war with all the repercussions that might flow from that. There are stirrings of discontent, independence in Eastern Europe. That has occurred before. There are more now. You, of course, have read this morning of what is happening in Romania where President Ceausescu is taking a very independent line in foreign policy, although anyone who has visited his country knows that he runs a very tight shop insofar as a communist economy is concerned. But in Eastern Europe, we see the truth of something that was said many years ago by an American Secretary of State. Never in the history of civilization has there been a system that has had more success in extending its domination over nations and less success in gaining the approval of the people of those nations. That is the story in Poland. That is the story in Hungary. That is the story in Romania. 
than the other countries for the most part in Eastern Europe. I mentioned Africa a moment ago. As far as Africa is concerned, black Africa particularly, it is not a fertile soil for communism, the idea. It is, however, an inviting target for aggression, internal and external, and for dictatorial government because of the lack of governmental activities of experience which enable them to govern in another way. And so as we look at these various factors, we then come to the key question. And that question is, why is there talk about the decline of the West? Why is there so much pessimism in the West? Sir Robert Thompson, a distinguished analyst of world affairs, whom I consulted a great deal during the difficult years I was trying to bring the, bring the American involvement in Vietnam to an end, recently made this comment, that a nation's strength equals its resources plus manpower times will. There is no question about the resources of the West. We already know its advantage is enormous. There is no question also about our military capability. We may be behind in certain areas, but with the enormous advantage that we have insofar as economic power is concerned, if a race is to be had, if we cannot have control of arms, we will win it, and the Soviet knows it. But there is a question, a question that has been raised by many, Solzhenitsyn at Harvard, other scholars in America, in Britain, and in other countries in Europe. Is there the will, the faith, the belief? I think I would analyze the problem of will in perhaps four, maybe five categories. First, there are those who are the defeatists. They throw up their hands. They believe that the tide of the future rests on the other side, that we're going to lose. So we might as well relax and enjoy it to the extent that we can. And then there are those who are the fearful. They believe that while we might be able to avoid defeat, that the risk is too great, the risk of a nuclear holocaust. And so you come out with the formula, better be red than dead. And then there, of course, there is that group of people that I would categorize very respectfully as being naive. That really, it doesn't make that much difference. Communism isn't that bad. And that is combined with a fourth group who simply have lost faith in your system, in ours, in the values of the West. The very profound scholar George Kennan, whom you have read about and studied, who developed the theory of containment immediately after World War II, has recently written that, speaking of the United States at least, that America no longer has anything to say to the world. We are too decadent, too corrupt. Drugs, pornography, all the sins, of course, of which you are aware. And that as far as we're concerned... <laughs> And as far as the West is concerned, and America in particular, we should turn inward, limit our activities abroad, rather than attempting to teach others to do as we do. Now that is one point of view, those that I have named. Let me come to my own and then turn as soon as I can to your questions. Needless to say, I do not share those views. I am a realist, a pragmatist, 
I do know that we face great challenges, particularly in the military field. But I believe we have the power. I believe we can develop the will. I believe we should. And I believe, I believe it deeply. And I shall always believe it till the day I die. That with everything that is wrong in our society and in the free societies, we advertise our weaknesses while in theirs they bury theirs. I believe that what we stand for is worth saving. I'm not saying to this young generation, worth dying for. I do not believe there will be a third world war. I think it can be avoided. But I will say to you, what we stand for is worth living for. That is what I would like to leave to this young generation of leaders. As I look across this room, I, I know you're very young. You didn't seem that young 20 years ago. And yet I know there is great potential in this room. I think of what you, this institution, has meant to America, what has meant to Britain. Five of your officers have become British prime ministers. I realize, too, that I'm in a very honored position to be here. But Mr. Moylan dropped the little hint to me that this was simply the preliminary bout before the main event when you elect your own president. <laughs> What you have meant to America, <laughs> what you have meant to America, maybe some of you are not aware, but included among the Rhodes Scholars who have made it in our country politically, a former Speaker of the House of Representatives, a former Secretary of State, a former Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a present Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, one of the best quarterbacks in the National Football League. <laughs> and he is so brainy, he'll probably make it in politics too. <laughs> and finally, a member of the most powerful group in all of America in our diffusion or balance of powers, Mr. Howard K. Smith, the distinguished commentator for ABC. <laughs> now, I regret to say that I cannot report to you that any one of your colleagues from this institution ever made it as president of the United States, that is. But I will confidently predict to you that before the end of this century, one of them probably will. Maybe one of you. And so finally, Mr. President, I come to the questions. And in doing so, I just recall that 20 years ago, the first question right out of the box came from up in the gallery. And uh, I was, of course, waiting for something profound about how are British-American relations going to be in the next 15 years and so forth. It was a rather interesting question. He said, Mr. Vice President, why are you here? For a loan? <laughs> I don't know what my answer was, but let me tell you, if I was here for a loan this time, and this shows you how things have changed, Please give it to me in pounds and not in dollars. As I said before, he has very kindly agreed to take questions, so uh, if you'd just like to put your hand up and wait for me to call you, and then we'll take them one at a time, I hope. Okay? 
Right, we we'll start there in the front row. Um, Mr. President, can I ask you a question about the fall of Southeast Asia to the Communists? Uh, Dr. Kissinger. Uh, Dr. Kissinger said in 1975, when Cambodia and South Vietnam fell to the Communists, uh, that he did not think this would have occurred had Watergate not occurred. Do you agree with that? I would not want to leave the impression that had I remained in office that I could have avoided the fall of Vietnam uh, because that obviously would lead to the conclusion that President Ford could have done something that would have avoided that. Let me say that had the Congress acceded to President Ford's request for additional funds for military assistance to the government of South Vietnam, South Vietnam would not have fallen. When the North Vietnamese started their offensive, their final offensive, in the early part of 1975, they had a three-to-one advantage in tanks, a two-to-one advantage in heavy artillery, and an unbelievable advantage in terms of supplies. Now, it was a sad and tragic story. Incidentally, I was speaking yesterday with a very distinguished man, Sir Alec Hume, and I pointed out to him that we had somewhat of a parallel, not in the actual events, but in terms of what great nations can or can't do. A great nation is certainly pretty able, usually, to fight a big war where everybody participates. But it is terribly difficult for a great nation to fight a small war. The British found that out in the Boer War. We found that out in Vietnam. My final point on Vietnam is this. It did not need to be lost. The responsibility for losing it is twofold. One, the Soviet Union, in violation of certainly their commitments to us that they would not continue to instigate the North and supply it with the additional uh, forces that they did, and second, the failure of the Congress of the United States to grant President Ford's request for arms so that at least the South Vietnamese would be able to fight on their own. And finally, as far as the legacy is concerned, uh, I know those who say the South Vietnam wasn't worth keeping, wasn't worth saving, the Q government was corrupt, and it did have corruption, the Q government didn't allow enough freedom of the press, and it didn't. The Chu government didn't allow a free enough election and that it did not. And yet I can only say this, before the Chu fell, there were 17 newspapers in Saigon. Before he fell, a fourth or a third of the National Assembly were his strong opponents. There were elections. Now there are no elections. There are no newspapers. There is only one. And there is no opposition in the parliament. As far as I'm concerned, when you see the tragic boat people, I think that's a pretty good indication that what Lenin said, and it was he who authored this phrase so many years ago, refugees are people who vote with their feet. I don't see anybody wanting to get back into Vietnam. I see a lot that want to get out. Could I ask all members to speak as loudly as possible when they ask their questions so they can be heard all over the hall, please? Um, take one here. Uh, Mr. President, if you were able uh, to take one major decision uh, of the last 10 years and have it over again for the purpose of making it differently in foreign affairs, would you indicate to the House which one that would be, or are you satisfied that all your major decisions were correct ones? Well, being a humble man, I won't say that. <laughs> uh, in the field of foreign affairs, I can't say that any one of them was right, totally. Uh, I don't think anybody would be able to judge, for example, that our China initiative was right until the end of the century. I think it was. I think it was probably my most important decision. Uh, it was one that I developed before I became president. 
It's one which Dr. Kissinger enthusiastically endorsed and carried out brilliantly. Uh, and yet, uh, depending upon what happens, people may raise questions as to whether it was the right thing to do. Uh, I think perhaps, uh, and you have not implied this, but I will imply it for some of the audience who I think with justification would. The idea might be, when I came into office, not having sent the American forces into Vietnam, the first 16,000 were sent by President Kennedy, uh, the next 500,000 were sent by President Johnson. Uh, we had a situation there where there were 300 dying a day. Uh, it seemed to be a war of no end. Uh, and there were many who said, why didn't I just blame it on my Democratic predecessors, pull all of the Americans out and let it fall? It was tempting politically, but never tempting from the standpoint of the country for as far as its future was concerned. Had South Vietnam fallen then, as it has later fallen, I think the repercussions on the balance of Southeast Asia, on Japan and on others, could have been catastrophic. And the other point is that if we could have done more earlier, I know that looking at it from the hawk standpoint rather than the super dove standpoint. You have the super doves, the super hawks, both are wrong in my view, in this area and in others. But the super hawks say, when we came in, why didn't we go in and do then what we did later, the thing that brought them to the con conference table and ended it? The problem is that had we moved with great force at that time, the American public would not have taken it. The country was not ready for it then. Second, I was taking the long look. If we had moved very decisively against Vietnam, North Vietnam, at that point, I think the possibility of our opening to China and also establishing a new relation with the Soviet, difficult as that has been, might have been destroyed. So in the long haul, I don't mean that we did everything right. At least at that time, it seemed to be the right thing to do. And it worked out certainly with regard to the Chinese and the Russians as we'd hoped. I have one more here in the front. In view, yeah. in view of your uh, record throughout the 50s and the McCarthy period um, of very fierce anti-communism, do you think that perhaps if you had been rather less efficient in domestic politics, détente could have come a decade or more earlier than it did? Has everybody been able to hear the questions in the back? Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I, Mr. Mr. President, uh, it's a very nice term, Mr. President. <laughs> in essence, the question was that it, had I not been the fierce anti-communist I was in the 50, uh, might not detente and probably the opening in China and other things come about? Well, I think that uh, rather exaggerates the influence that I may have had on President Eisenhower and others in the 50s. And second, I would also suggest that in the 50s, the situation was quite different. Uh, in the 50s, when the Soviet Union and the PRC were one bloc, uh, it was not the time, certainly, to have the kind of initiative to undertake it that we later took. Uh, and second, uh, as far as uh, the new communication with the Soviet was concerned, the uh, Nego uh, negotiation rather than confrontation. Uh, with the Soviet in the very aggressive stage that it was in, and looking at the Chinese with them in, a, in their early stages, they were very aggressive, as you may recall, in Indonesia, for example, in Malaysia, uh, or in the early parts of the war in Vietnam, uh, in Bangkok and the rest. Uh, it simply would not have been the right policy for the United States at that time uh, to open a new relation with the Chinese. Uh, let me say another thing from a political standpoint, because I know a few of you are perhaps, perhaps going into politics. You're thinking about it anyway. Uh, but my point is that from a political standpoint, I do not believe that uh, the man whom I defeated for the presidency, for whom I had great personal affection and political respect, uh, 
the former Vice President Humphrey, could have brought the country along on the China initiative. Not because he was pro-communist, he was not. But because he did not have the confidence of the anti-communist. Uh, the fact that I was known as an anti-communist, and I still am, I am pro-Chinese, and I am pro-Russian. I like the Russian people. I like the Chinese people. I like the Romanian people. I just don't like communism. <laughs> you see, but you see, in our country, and you see, in our country, maybe they do. I don't know. But in our country. Uh, we have extremes, just as you have in your country. And I was able to communicate with the super hawks. Uh, they weren't as comfortable with me as they would have been with somebody else. I wasn't their first choice, make no mistake about that, even in 1968. But on the other hand, they thought I could win, whereas maybe their first choice might not have won. And I would take anything I would get, of course. So under the circumstances, having gone in, I was able to make the move with the Chinese make the move with the Russians, and they'd say, well, we don't like what he's doing. Uh, we wish that he hadn't moved this way, but we just can't believe that SOB is going to be taken in by those fellows, and that's the way it worked. Um, you have one over there. Mr. President, sir, um, to misquote Webster, should, should something chance to poison it near the head, death and disease through all the land to spread. Now, <laughs> bearing in mind the experience of the Soviet Union and certain parts of the African continent, does the honorable gentleman not agree that of all qualities essential for government, honor is the most important? Well, I, I think the sense of the question, and I couldn't quite hear it all, <laughs> And it's not your fault, sir. It's the acoustics in the hall. I'll, I'll contribute $10 to build a new one if you need it. <laughs> but I like the hall. I like the hall. No. The, the question was that uh, considering all the factors that we have mentioned with Africa and so forth, uh, isn't honor the most important uh, element uh, I guess in government or in a man or what have you. Yeah, I would, I would say yes. I would say yes. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, I uh, would say to this uh, particular audience or to any audience that uh, political, a political man, uh, he, he, he will rise or fall based on that. He has to gain the respect and confidence of his colleagues. He's got to keep his word. If he doesn't keep his word, he may win in the short run, he isn't going to win in the long run. Uh, and uh, I think one of the problems with regard to uh, what we call the Watergate business, uh, because while you didn't say that, uh, I will imply <laughs> that uh, uh, a question was raised that despite uh, some of the things that I had done that they felt were worthwhile, uh, that deserved support, uh, they felt that on this matter, uh, that I had not handled it properly, uh, and they were right. I screwed it up, and I paid the price. Mr. Nixon, with regard to revelations <coughs> about the last three presidents, uh, <laughs> With regard to the revelations about the last three presidents in the United States, particularly in sense of <coughs> the sense of power they developed, could you argue whether it was the man that corrupted the office or the office that corrupted the man? Uh, I think the question relates to whether. Uh, what I have to do is to keep my left ear closed and listen with the right, I guess. I think the question relates to the fact that in view of, of some of the things that have happened with the last three presidents, 
uh, insofar as the conduct of the office. Is it a question of the office corrupting the man or the man corrupting the office? Uh, I would suggest that uh, the office of the president is, has, is a powerful one. Uh, I would also suggest that uh, there are no easy calls that a president makes. Uh, if, for example, a president is, confer and is confronted with bombings that are taking the lives of innocent people, uh, of radical groups uh, that uh, are uh, threatening more activities of that sort, uh, he has to make very difficult decisions as to what can be done to save the lives of innocent people. Uh, and uh, that is a primary responsibility of presidents, and presidents in, e in their ways have had to meet it. Uh, for example, uh, when a president is confronted with a threat from abroad, uh, uh, we all know that a president uh, then ha uh, the, the, the has devolved upon him from the Constitution not only the power but the duty uh, to deal with that threat in a way that it will not uh, damage the country uh, and, of course, harm the people of the country. Now, the difficulty with that, uh, on the one side, the responsibility of a president to deal with threats, external threats, and second, the responsibility to deal with internal threats that threaten the lives of people. The difficulty with that is that when the president uses power, that then, if the power is in excess, that too is a threat to the peace of the freedom of the people. Uh, Lincoln's use, for example, of, of uh, habeas corpus uh, uh, during the war between the states. Uh, as you know, he abolished it or put it aside. Uh, that was extra constitutional, but it was necessary to do it. Uh, and then, of course, in the 60s, with the riots and all the other things, uh, it was necessary. At least uh, President Kennedy and his attorney general felt that way. President Johnson did, and I felt that way. Uh, it was necessary uh, to at least have what we thought the most thorough investigation of these groups because we thought it was more important to apprehend those that were going to kill innocent people uh, than it was uh, to allow those people uh, to be the subject of that kind of a of kind of attack, and then after they were killed, to have to apprehend those who were guilty. Let me use one example, uh, which poses a very difficult problem for a president. You all remember, I'm sure, in the Olympic Games in Munich, when the Israeli athletes were all murdered by a group called Al Fatah. I think that's the, proper, the way it's pronounced. Phonetically, it's that way. Either. The Al Fatah group, we learned through the much maligned, maligned FBI, we learned had established a network in the United States. That group was apprehended. It was broken up uh, in the United States through what was called wiretapping and break-in by the FBI. Now, on the one side, those who are civil libertarians, and I understand how they feel, would say we, that nothing will justify, or justify wiretapping being approved by the Attorney General, and of course the Attorney General acts for the President. And my question is this. Should El Fata not have been broken up, and it wouldn't have been broken out without that kind of surreptitious entry? And should we have had that kind of an incident in some place in the United States? Or wasn't it worthwhile under those circumstances where we had a foreign-controlled group of radicals who were threatening to kill Americans at a certain area, shouldn't the president and his attorney general and his director of his FBI, weren't they justified in approving the extra means that were necessary to break it up? Some say no. As far as I'm concerned, I say yes because those innocent people were my responsibility, and I take that responsibility. Question over there. Mr. President, uh, in view of subsequent events, 
Um, do you regret your decision to invade Cambodia? What I regret about my decision to invade Cambodia was that I didn't do it sooner. Uh, let me explain briefly, uh, and, I, and I, I, I don't want to filibuster, particularly because before a uh, politically sophisticated group, because you'll know what it is. But be that as it may, here was the situation. Cambodia at, in 1970. Cambodia was an area where <clears throat> there was a whole group of sanctuaries, so-called in which North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops uh, were stationed. There were no Cambodians whatever there. Shianuk, whom I knew, I met him back in 53, when he was still playing the violin. But in any event, Shianuk had told one of our representatives that as far as he was concerned, he didn't care what we did in that part of Cambodia because no Cambodians were there, and he'd like to get the North Vietnamese out of his country. Now, what was happening is they were in that part of the country, and then they would come across the border into Vietnam, and they were killing Americans and our South Vietnamese allies by the tens of thousands, and then they'd go back over. We couldn't even pursue them. We couldn't do anything. Also, in that spring, April, they were sending great numbers of troops into Cambodia, preparing for what is called the Tet Offensive of that year. It was to be shortly after Tet. Had we not struck them then, we would have had enormous casualties. So what were we to do? Let them have this privileged sanctuary or go in there? Now, let me just add one other point. When we talk about invading Cambodia, may I ask, in World War II, when Eisenhower ordered the landing on Normandy, was that invading France? No, the purpose of that was to destroy the German armies that were occupying France, and he was right to do it. When we went into Cambodia, we weren't invading Cambodia. Chinook didn't object to it. We were going there for the purpose of blunting an offensive that would have killed American men. I'd do it again. I wish I'd done it sooner, and the war had been over sooner. I know you're, I know you're a very strong supporter of detente, but uh, do you, what's your response to the objections to it? Uh, <laughs> What's your responses to the objections to detente that it recognizes the communist governments of the people concerned and also that even when you get into negotiations with these governments they uh, keep on breaking the various agreements such as the Soviet Union is doing with the Helsinki agreement as they did in Vietnam as you pointed out earlier. Let me ask you sir, do you, do I, do I understand, uh, I know yours is a question but is your position one that you have doubts about Helsinki and doubts about the top? No. Uh, are you, are you asking whether I have doubts? I'm asking whether you have uh, doubts and what your answers to these objections are. Good. Okay. The question, I think, in summary and in fairness is this. In view of the fact that the Soviet Union is violating what we would consider what many call the spirit of detente, uh, uh, and the spirit of the Helsinki agreements through their violations of human rights, through what they're doing, for example, in Africa, through waging war by proxy, through Cuba and so forth. He didn't mention that, but I would include that in it. Uh, that in view of all of the Soviet Union's conduct, uh, what then is my attitude about detente, having been one that is supposed to have helped to initiate it, which of course was the case. Uh, if I could just take a little more than the time on this, because this covers a, a periphery of, of issues, and we have to understand what we're talking about. First, what is detente? Detente is not entente. The only <coughs> way that they're the same is that they're French words. Entente, as you know, entente means an alliance between nations with similar interest or shared interest. 
Détente is not an alliance. Détente simply means a process of negotiation between nations with different interests. Now, when we understand it that way, when we say détente, that doesn't mean that the United States and the Soviet Union have similar interests, uh, that we have similar values, that we believe in the same things. As a matter of fact, in my talks with Brezhnev and Kosygin and others, uh, we were very blunt. Uh, I pointed out, and they pointed out to me, uh, where we did differ. Uh, and on those particular issues, there was no compromise. Now, what were we trying to do then? By detente, we were recognizing a fact of life. They're there, and we're here. Each of us has the power to blow each other up, and it's time to blow the world up. Now, what do we do? Communicate with them? Not know each other? Or do we find a way to communicate with them on issues where we are never going to agree so that those issues don't explode into war and then find a few areas where we can agree so that both sides will have a stake in keeping the peace. And so what we have here with detente, anti-communist on the one side, communist on the other side, totally disagreeing as to what the world should be like in the future. Now, how detente works, getting to know you, what does it mean? Does it help? It, it, it's, it's absolute nonsense to think that because a couple of leaders know each other, they're going to like each other. As a matter of fact, when you get to know each other, you're probably going to hate each other a little more. <laughs> but not necessarily. Getting to know you, however, reduces the possibility of miscalculation. And that's worth it. An example. The best one I can think of from our administration. In 1973, we had the second Soviet-American summit. In San Clemente, after midnight in my home, in the little library upstairs, Brezhnev woke up late, sent a message in through me through Kissinger, said, I want to talk. And so uh, we talked. <laughs> he talked mainly for three hours and the whole talk was about the Mideast we hadn't covered that in all of our other discussions at any length and he kept pounding the table and he said you've got to impose a settlement on the Israelis or there's going to be a blow up we are going to have to do things and I says I'm not going to impose a settlement on the Israelis or the Arabs because an imposed settlement will not be and should not be accepted by either and then he went on to say well if you don't do it he said, and any actions occur or struggle occurs, we are going to have to act. I said, in the event that there's any intervention of a major power in the Mideast, I said, the United States will have to react strongly. That's a summary of a three-hour conversation. <laughs> now, in later on in 1973 came the Yom Kippur War. The Israelis started to lose. I ordered the airlift. And then the Israelis started to win. And then Brezhnev sent a message saying, we're going to send a division, two divisions of Russian infantry in to Egypt and to Syria, and we invite you to send two divisions into Israel. <laughs> I sent a message back which in effect said, no way. Because of course I knew, and you would all know, we never want to get Russian and American divisions that close together because if they get that close together, particularly in that bottle situation, they'll rub together and bang, you're going to have a confrontation of some sort and probably an escalation to a major war. The message came back, I'm going to send them anyway. Unilaterally, he was going to send them in. I sent a message back. He still was going to send them in. Then I sent another message. It was the alert. Now, this was not the top alert, but it was high enough. It was an alert of our military forces around the world. That message got through. <laughs> now, why did it get through? Brezhnev is a realist. He does not want war. He wants the world, but he doesn't want war. <laughs> That, of course, is the great danger. 
not defeat in war, but defeat without war. But anyway, Brezhnev, when he receives the message on the alert, I am confident if he had not known me and guessed, and in this case he guessed properly, that, that I might react strongly, that I might. I left at least the doubt in his mind. The alert might not have worked. He would have thought, as the Chinese put it, that it was an empty cannon. And so thank God we didn't have to do it. Uh, he didn't send in the divisions. And then started the process, the process in which the Israelis and the Arabs, acting through Kissinger, began to disengage. We had the Israeli disengagement on the one front and the Golan Heights disengagement with the Syrians on the other front. And President Carter is capped it off of, along with Sadat and Begin and the splendid achievements at Camp David. And incidentally, there will be an Egyptian-Israeli peace settlement. It'll be rocky for a while, but there will be because the option for war on both sides is unacceptable. And that's when people make peace. There'll be other troubles in the future. But at least for that one, we can be thankful. Now, that's the way detente worked there. Getting to, it's very important that Brezhnev know Carter so that he doesn't underestimate Carter. Uh, Carter has made some moves, the cancellation of the B-1, the cancellation of the Minuteman III, uh, the putting the crews in the back burner, uh, slowing down the MX, etc., which may give Brezhnev, may have given him, a feeling that maybe Carter is weak. Now, anybody who has come from where Carter did, won the nomination against great odds, then won the election, he's no panty waste. And so it is important. I'm, I, I do not know him well. But I would say that Brezhnev and Carter meeting with each other means that when they come to these sticky areas which we're going to have, it's very important that neither misjudge the other. Carter must not misjudge Brezhnev. He must not get the impression that Brezhnev could be pushed around, because he can't be. And by the same token, Brezhnev must not misjudge Carter. So detente works that way. Then just to sum it up briefly, as far as detente is concerned, it's important for the leaders to know each other. Second, in the economic areas that have no military significance, it's important to build those ties, because it gives the Russians a little stake. In, not, in, in peace. And third, in other areas, it's very important for, in this whole area of the Taunt, that we recognize that we can accomplish things if we have communication in private channels that all the public talking in the world wouldn't do. And this allows me to comment in this extended answer, because I know this is on your minds too, on the whole question of human rights as it relates to the Soviet Union. Now, let's all understand one thing. Everybody is for human rights who lives in the Western world. And I think a lot of people who live under the communist rule are for it, too. The question is not whether, but how. I applaud fine statements on human rights. I like to make them myself. <laughs> but let me say, what I am interested in is a result. What do you accomplish? Let's take Jewish immigration. I have strong feelings about that. I have friends who have strong feelings on it. When I came into office, you know how many Jews were let out of the Soviet Union in 1968? 600. 600. What do we do about it? I didn't make any speeches about it, although I felt very deeply about it. Many of my Jewish friends came to me, and non-Jewish friends, because this is something that isn't just one religion. This covers everybody. It's, it's a terrible thing that these people couldn't get out. And they said, won't you say something? I said, no. I said, let me handle it my own way. And Kissinger and I worked right together along these things. We kept talking to the Russians about other things they wanted, in the economic area, and so forth and so on. And they, of course, wanted to negotiate arms control. And we kept talking about that. But on the back burner was always this question of Jewish emigration. We would raise it quietly, but we didn't put them in the public spot by making a public statement to the effect that unless they agreed to do something with regard to their internal situation, we weren't going to talk, for example, about how we might limit arms. We weren't going to talk about methods to reduce the danger of war. 
we weren't going to make those issues hostage, in effect, to the human rights issue. Now, an argument could be made for doing it the other way, but let's see how it worked. As a result of all that, of this kind of an approach, by 1973, 37,000 Jews got emigration visas from the Soviet Union. And then there began to be more and more public condemnation of the Soviet on this. You know how many got out last year? 10,000. A great nation will not and cannot give in to public pressure with regard to its, what it considers its internal affairs. So don't put them on that spot. But on the other hand, put them on the spot privately. And so, in essence, what I am saying is this. In this whole area of detente and communications between nations, between nations in this area of human rights, if you want to make votes, if you want to get a lot of good publicity, yes. Do a lot of threatening and talking and this and that and the other thing. If you want to accomplish results, just remember this one thing where the Kremlin is concerned. I've been in the Kremlin. The walls are very thick. <laughs> when you're inside the Kremlin, it's plenty hard to be heard. When you're outside, you can't be heard at all. And therefore, I say the way to get action from them, let them know that there is linkage. But don't embarrass them publicly. In that way, you're going to get results. That's just the lesson in diplomacy. Archbishop Makarios, the Castro of the Mediterranean. Do you have any reflections on American policy in the Aegean in the 1970s? I think it, it's a quote from a, a Greek newspaper to calling the Karios the Castro of the Mediterranean they quoted you in 1974. Well, I, I had met him at one point. Uh, I don't recall the quote. Uh, I would only say that uh, that would have been awful rough if I called him that. <laughs> but I, I, I would also say this. Uh, I have been to both Greece and Turkey. I have not been to Cyprus. Uh, I think it's a great tragedy that these two countries, who depend upon each other so much, who are the southern hinge of NATO, uh, are allowing uh, this fight over Castro, which I know has very, very deep roots in both countries, are allowing that uh, to make themselves enemies and at the same time making it very difficult uh, for them to continue to cooperate in the great NATO alliance. I don't have an answer to it. Uh, and as far as uh, Nicarios or any other Cypriot leader is concerned, if I said such a thing, I certainly apologize for it. Uh, one at the side over there. Yes. Can you hear me? You, you recently emerged from several years of seclusion caused by a political debate which many Amer Americans, excuse me, many Americans still hold you responsible. Um, you were given a presidential pardon, sir, in order to put an end to a sort of chapter in American political history. Your re-emergence in public life is viewed in some quarters in America, at least, with Frank Horry. Now, despite the fact that we're all extremely pleased you've come and given us such a charming talk on foreign affairs, do you feel that you still have, might have a positive contribution to make either American domestic politics or international affairs? <laughs> I think the question, in essence, is that in, in, in view of my... Uh, uh, of my having to leave office the way that I did and in uh, view of the m mistakes that I made on, on the political front, which I agree that I made, uh, as I would, uh, uh, to, to put it in the words of, uh, of Talleyrand, uh, uh, I know that he isn't very popular in England, but he said some <laughs> clever things. He said, when people ask what was Watergate, I said it was worse than a crime. It was a blunder, and a very bad blunder and uh, badly handled. And I understand that. And in view of all that, do I still think, and am I so presumptuous to think as I have any contribution to make? Well, I sometimes wonder about it. Uh, let me uh, 
Let me philosophize a bit with some of you here about life in general. <laughs> and I'm not filibustering because perhaps this is more useful than all this stuff about missiles and throw weight and the rest. Uh, anybody who gets to the, the high office of the presidency tries to do the best he can. Uh, my years there were not easy ones. Uh, I've already pointed out that all wars are difficult for a president. Uh, war particularly is difficult for me. It's hard for you to believe this, I suppose, because I'm, I'm uh, supposed to be a hardline warmonger, bomber, etc., etc., etc. But uh, it must tear every president apart to have to write to those next to kin. It did me. Uh, I happen to be a Quaker. Uh, I don't hold that out. I don't wear it in my sleeve. I don't believe in that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, well, I, I think that some of my good Quaker friends are a bit naive at times, uh, because in the real world, uh, we sometimes have to fight for what we believe, yet that's the ideal that I believe in. And all my public life, I have felt if I wanted to leave anything, far more than maybe a better uh, economic system or, or far more than a better political system. It would be a world in which this generation does not go through what every other generation in this century has gone through, a war. I've always talked about the generation of peace. I hope it's a century of peace. And it was difficult for me for another reason. As I alluded earlier, wars for a great power which are big wars, are tough, but when you have the country behind you, they, that's leadership. But for uh, wars against a little power, when a country is divided, it's, it's difficult. Uh, you hear these people outside, and, and I, uh, it's not pleasant. I mean, I, I'm used to it. I, I've had to develop a little stronger voice as a result, but I'm used to it. But I never forget, you know, there are many moments that stick in your mind. This is sort of inconsequential. I went down to Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg. I think it was in 1971 to, to make a speech to a world law conference on world peace and that. And a very, very attractive girl. I, I would guess she was 16, 17 sort of reminded me of my daughter when she was that age, my older daughter, who's blue-eyed and blonde. This girl was blue-eyed and blonde. And, and as I was walking in, she, she came right up against me, uh, walking up to me, broke through the Secret Service line, and just spit right in my face. She said, you murder. Well, I borrowed a handkerchief from the Secret Service guy and wiped it off and went in. It's about as hard a speech as I ever made. Because you don't, you don't want anybody. I don't mind, you know, adults saying, I don't agree with you. I don't mind getting a few rocks thrown at me. I've had that too. Uh, I don't mind being cartoon. I may not like it, but I've got a reason to fight back. But to have young people like this, to think that somebody who has been president, uh, is one who has not even tried to make a contribution to their lives, then you kind of think you're a failure. But let me say this. Uh, I did fail in the political area. I failed in handling a little thing, and by failing to handle it well, uh, that colors everything that you did. But on the other hand, I feel that when it comes to the great goal of building a better world, that if we had not made the China Initiative, if we had not made the moves that we had to the, toward the Soviet Union, even though it's pretty hairy and it's going to be some tough negotiation before it works out, I think the chances for a world of peace would be far less than they are. And for that, I have no apology for those achievements. Now, what I'm going to do the rest of my life is this. It, it, it's very comforting. You know, I have enough uh, to 
get out with my wife and sit and contemplate my navel in the Pacific, uh, uh, walk my dog uh, on the beach. I don't hunt and I don't fish, but I, you know, I could play a little golf and the rest. But you know, if I did that, went to the parties each night to which I could go, ate the good food, turned my mind off as I watched television, I would be dead mentally in a year and physically in two. And so as long as I have any breath in me, I'm going to talk about the great issues affecting the future of the world in my own country. If I think I've got something that's going to help, I'll say it. If it's going to hurt, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. But somebody... <laughs> but I feel at this time, I feel at this time, and I know I'm sounding melodramatic, and I intend to, but I feel at this time The West is a sleeping giant. It has all the power, unbelievable power, that the world has ever known economically. And that means militarily it can have all that. And it's a sleeping giant because there are so many in this country, in our country, and in other countries who uh, perhaps have given up. Uh, they, they've lost faith in what we're doing. They fear too much the adversary. Uh, they, they think perhaps we're on the losing side. I think we have to wake up. I think we have to, of course, recognize we've got our faults. But we have a system in which we can change those faults. And under those circumstances, I feel that I, as one voice, I won't be listened to as much as when I was in office, and not as much because of some of the failures that I had. But as long as I've got any breath in me, before this kind of audience or any kind of audience, I'm going to speak up very strongly for what I think will bring peace, but also very strongly for what I think will continue to, what will contribute to freedom in the world, because the two must go together, peace with freedom. That's what I have fought for all my life, and I'm going to continue to as long as I live. Can you tell me precisely what role you think that you are going to adopt, say, in the future, in both the political field at home and abroad? The question is, what role will I play in the future in the political field at home and abroad? Uh, well, politically, uh, my political life is over, and many applaud out there. <laughs> uh, as you know, under our Constitution, uh, no one can be elected to the office of president more than twice. And, you know, <laughs> I, I checked with Mr. Marlin. He says, I'm too old to get into Oxford, so I can't run for president of the union. But when, I hear, <clears throat> when I hear what a spicy kind of election you have, even though I've had some tough elections, I don't want to try that one. <laughs> but so politically, in that sense, I plan to play no role I, uh, in the party, as a candidate, for a candidate, anything. However, while I've retired from politics, I haven't retired from life. That means public life. And so the kind of a role I will play will be in the public, uh, public arena. I intend to speak on occasion when the forum is a proper one. Uh, I will do some writing. I have another book that I'm working on. It's an I never agree to write a book. It takes so much time, but, but I've agreed to do a second one. Uh, in any event, it's a second book on the future, having covered the past. I worked on that for three and a half years. What's going to happen in the end of, by the end of this century? The challenge to the West, but not just consulting our fears, looking to how we can build a better world. And then, in addition to speaking and to writing, uh, I will from time to time, when uh, individuals can find their way to San Clemente, uh, on a private basis, I will talk to them and give them advice, free advice, and it'll be worth just what it costs. <laughs> Take one more.
Mr. President, is it true that you chose Gerald Ford as your Vice President because you knew you would be guaranteed a pardon after you resigned? <laughs> The question is, uh, is it true that I told, that I chose uh, Gerald Ford to be vice president because I, he, I knew he would guarantee a pardon after I resigned? Well, let me say first that if I had known, <laughs> it, if I had thought for one moment that Gerald Ford would accept the vice presidency on that condition, I certainly wouldn't have picked him because he wouldn't be the proper president. There was no discussion of it. There was no commitment of it. And uh, he is not that kind of a man, and neither am I. Uh, the, the second point is that as far as he is concerned, uh, I chose him because I had known him for so many years. I knew that he shared my views uh, on... Uh, both domestic and foreign policy issues, not all of them, but that, so that there would be continuity. Uh, I thought he would do an effective job. I think he did. I'm proud that I did choose him, uh, and uh, I think he should be proud of his service to the country. Uh, this one here. Mr. President, you referred a moment ago to small mistakes, and in your interview with David Frost, you referred to that pipsqueak, pipsqueak Watergate thing. Do you stand by that description? The, the question is that in my interview with David Frost, I referred to that pipsqueak Watergate thing. I think perhaps your, your recollection is a little different. I referred to uh, one of the participants uh, in, in one of the series of questions uh, as a pipsqueak. Pipsqueak is a term that's used for an individual, not for an event. Uh, and uh, uh, they, uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> and the individual I was referring to, and, uh, and I re and my memory isn't photographic, but after all, uh, after all, uh, I, I can, I can of course remember any answer I gave to a Cambridge man. Mr. Frost went to Cambridge, I understand. But in any event, uh, I recall that uh, the discussion was about Daniel Ellsberg, and you probably remember that's where you read that. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg, you may remember, uh, was the one who. Uh, Let's see, uh, the word is pinched, isn't it? He pinched the Pentagon Papers and then put them out, uh, and uh, there was a great hue and cry about it. Uh, it, was, it was an illegal act, uh, and uh, it caused great problems with our foreign policy. It exposed some of our agents abroad, unfortunately. Uh, it, uh, we had a number of complaints from foreign embassies because they felt that some of the things they'd given, spoken in confidence to, uh, to our own government people might be divulged. Let me point out briefly, the Pentagon Papers, again, shows you sometimes you have to do things that are, in, are not in your political interest. The Pentagon Papers were, in effect, a critique of the Johnson-Kennedy handling of the war in Vietnam. It had nothing to do with our administration. The reason that we had to oppose the New York Times uh, and others who, having received the papers, as they did from Ellsberg or his colleagues, had to oppose their printing it, and then the Supreme Court overruled us, was that if top-secret documents could, with impunity, uh, be taken away by a government servant or a former government servant and printed in the newspapers, it would mean that you could not have confidential conversations with your top people, uh, on foreign policy or any other kind of matters. Nobody's going to confide you. He's going to be talking for the record rather than for your, the benefit of what the policy should be. It would also mean that in wartime, and this was in wartime, uh, that it would cause potentially enormous difficulties with your allies, with your friends, and give comfort to the enemy, uh, which it could well have done. Now, Mr. Ellsberg was the one who had, of course, taken the papers, he'd put them out, he was on trial, and then on a technicality, he was, he was let go. Uh, uh, 
And uh, so that was that. I said that uh, when he asked me uh, about the situation, I believe in discussing Mr. Ellsberg, and I think my recollection is correct, I said, I think he's a pipsqueak. I still think he is. I have one question over here from member. Uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, ex-president, uh, one ex-president to another. <laughs> a great American once said that Britain had lost an empire, alas. Uh, that Britain had lost an empire and not yet found a world realm. Now, do you see the future realm of Britain? as being that of a rather tedious, rather boring and dull, <laughs> that awful little island. Do you, think, do you think that the future possibly offers a more tantalizing and scary <laughs> international role for Britain and for us young Britons in the world? <laughs> It's obvious he's a candidate for president. <laughs> well, I am sure that all of you would expect me to uh, speak well of Britain's future in the, ro in the world, and I will. Uh, but I'm going to speak quite realistically about it, because I, I know that if I just gave you the usual palaver, you wouldn't believe it anyway. You may not believe me anyway, but nevertheless, uh, this is the way I see it. Britain's gone through some tough times. Uh, however, I should point out that I just saw the CPI figures, the cost of living figures from the United States, for last month, and now Britain's inflation is lower than ours. That's not bad. Ours is bad. Uh, I was rather surprised in doing my briefing before this meeting to find out that your, the increase in your <coughs> uh, 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 productivity was slightly less, uh, slightly more than ours. There, the, the projected increase for the year 1979, all of you economists can check this. Uh, ours is going to be about 2.3, yours is going to be about 2.7. That's surprising. I didn't think that that was going to happen. Uh, I also find that in looking at the figures, that uh, as far as unemployment is concerned, yours is about equal to us. Uh, so much for that. These are numbers, and people do not eat numbers. And, uh, they can't spend them and all that sort of thing. I know that. Far more important is something also you can't eat, but it's something you can't live without. And that is uh, it's faith, it's spirit, it's what you believe. And uh, when some people come back from Britain, from Britain and say the British have had it, I mean the labor unions are out of control, they're asking for too much, and uh, even though the prime minister is a has a wage policy which is very fair and, and a great majority by poll of labor union members favor uh, holding the lid at 7% or whatever it is, uh, that some of the leaders are irresponsible and they're going to bust it and some of the businessmen are irresponsible because they don't want to lose any more any, any longer. So they're going along and you just wonder if you're on that treadmill and that the economy is going to continue to go bad and that, you're, that Britain, and this is the major problem Britain faces, is going to continue to be in a position where its goods cannot compete in the world. Can't compete with the French, let alone, of course, the Germans, the Japanese. A lot have troubles competing with them and with the Americans. That's the economic picture. Uh, Everybody wishes Britain the best economically. And, and we, we, we hope your, your inflation policy does prove to be relatively successful. Uh, we do hope, too, that your productivity does increase. 
we do hope that a new sense of responsibility does come in labor and in management. But most important is something else. That young Bretons remember that this is a great country. It was and it is. And young Britons have got to remember that Britain has been great when things have been a lot tougher than they are now in this century.